In the last video, we explored the artistic text tool. In this video, let's take a deeper dive in text and check out the typography options we have in Affinity. When we have text selected, the top toolbar will show the most common text properties we can change. But we can also use the text panel, which we can enable from the window menu under the text section. In this video, we'll focus only on the character panel and I will probably do a follow-up on the other text panels and options in a future video. By the way, the character panel can also be shown by using this A button from the toolbar when you have text selected or have the text tool enabled. The character panel is divided into sections and we'll start with the general section, which contains the basic font properties. First, we have a drop down with a filter for the font list. You can, for example, set this to recently used, which filters the font list based on the fonts you used earlier. This can be super handy, especially if you have a large list of fonts. Next, we have the list with the fonts, where the currently used font is selected. On the next field, we see the current font size in points. We can either use the drop down to select a predefined size or manually enter the size we need. On the next drop down, the actual applied font style to the selected text is shown. If the selected text has different font styles applied, it will be shown as custom. The available font styles depend on the selected font, and using this drop down, we can modify the applied style. Setting a new font style will replace all the previous styles in the selected text. The button with a V is only available if the selected font is a variable font. Variable fonts allow you to adjust the accents, which we can use to control how heavy or slanted a font looks like. Depending on the selected font, you can have multiple parameters you can modify to change the look of a font. To access these parameters, we can use this button in Affinity Photo. The last two boxes are the foreground and the background color selection for the selected text. We can also change the font foreground by using the color panel. But to change the background color, you will need to use the character panel. Finally, we have a drop down box for the custom character styles. We'll take a look at the styles later in the video or maybe in a future video. The next section we have in the character panel is the decoration section. Here we have the various underline options. As you might notice, for bold and italic, we will need to use the top toolbar. And technically, bold and italic are not really decorations but a font style, which was available in the previous section. For the underline, you can also choose a color from the color drop down. Following the underline options, we have the strike through options, which works similar as the underline. But instead of putting a line under the characters, the line goes through the characters. Just like with the underline, we can set the color for the strike through line. On the second row, we have the outline options. This is very similar to the outline options of a curve object where you can set the thickness and change the line properties. This is also where you can change the outline color, for which, by the way, you could also use the color panel. Another way of changing the text outline properties without going to the character panel is by switching to the pen or note tool and then selecting the text. By using the top toolbar, you can now also change the outline properties of the text. Below the decoration section, we have the position and transform section, for which I quickly put together this explainer with terminology used in typefaces. Most of this terminology comes from the old printing process and is still being used in modern font design. So the first option we have is the kerning option. Kerning is the distance between two defined characters. Most fonts have a kerning table. This allows the font creator to create a balanced looking text when specific characters are used. The capital V and the capital A combination is a good example to demonstrate this. Currently, the kerning is set to zero, meaning no kerning is being applied. But when I change this to auto, notice how the A is coming closer to the V. 
by using auto, Affinity will use the defined kerning pairs in the used font. If needed, we can overwrite this. To do that, we first need to position our text cursor between the two characters, and now the kerning dropdown can be modified, allowing me to put the two letters even closer to each other. In most cases, however, there is no need to overrule the default kerning of a font. The next setting is tracking. This is the default gap between the characters. By decreasing this, we can move the characters closer to each other. And by increasing, we can separate the characters from each other. This is a very useful setting, especially if you're trying to make text with spaced characters, like in a logo. The baseline is the virtual line where the text sits on top. By adjusting the baseline, we can offset the text from this line. The leading override, actually I think it's called the letting override, is a way to offset the top space of a paragraph of text. It allows you to have your text start higher or lower than the default position, which can be handy in some cases. On the second column, we have the character transformations. First, we have the shear. By adjusting the shear, we can create these tilted characters similar to the italic style. Affinity also allows us to modify the horizontal and vertical scale of a character. I would suggest not doing this, but there could be valid reasons to change the scale of a character. For example, by a slight decrease in the horizontal scale, you could also make a more condensed look for your text. In this section, we also have the possibility to set whether the selected characters should be in superscript or subscript. Finally, we have the no break checkbox. By default, this is turned off and by turning this on, the text will not wrap in a text box. Basically, we're saying do not add virtual breaks to a line to make it fit into a text box. The next section is the language section. Normally, I don't mess around with these settings as I don't deal that much with foreign languages and mostly keeping everything to auto works fine for me. In the spelling drop down box, you can set the language for the selected text for spelling purposes. You can turn on the automatic spelling from the text menu, from the spelling sub menu, and then using check spelling while typing. If the text is not spelled correctly, the words will be marked with a red curvy underline. So setting the language of the text determines how the spelling is going to work. If you set the spelling language to none, the text will be skipped for spelling. Notice how the red marks are now gone. The same applies to hyphenation. The language defined will determine how words should be cut off by the end of a line. By the way, you can also add a soft hyphen in your words by using the Alt or Option key while typing in the minus symbol. This way, the text will be automatically cut off at the soft hyphen we just inserted when it reaches the end of a line. The next two drop down boxes are language specific settings for open type font faces. The options here are dependent on the used font. Here you can set which script you want to use. The script are the actual character glyphs used. The typography language determines how they are going to be used. For example, the open quote and close quote symbols could be determined by the language you set. As I mentioned, I'm not an expert on this matter, and the typography language and script is a big rabbit hole. Feel free to dive into that rabbit hole. The next section is a bit easier to explain. The optical alignment section allows us to reposition characters horizontally in order to get a better optical alignment. Sometimes perfectly aligning letters just doesn't look good and we need to optically align them. Using the type drop down, we can disable or enable the optical alignment options. We can use the default optical alignment settings inside the font itself or use a manual alignment. Notice how the letters T and Q move a bit to the left when we turn on the built in alignment. When we use the manual alignment, the list of characters will become available for editing, 
and we can manually define the offset from the left and the right for specific characters. For example, I have added the letter L to the list and as you can see, when I adjust the left value, it moves to the left. To show the effect for the right value, we need to right align the text. Now we can see the effect when we change the value for right. So keep in mind that this does not change the space around the character mid-sentence, but only the space at the beginning or the end of a sentence. The final section in the character panel is the typography section where you can enable various options in the font face which will affect how the characters are going to be shown. A very common option is ligatures. By turning this on, we can force the font to use a single glyph for a combination of letters. The FI combination is a very common ligature. Combinations are really dependent on the implementation of the used font face. The next option we can turn on and off is the contextual alternatives. Contextual alternates adjust the used glyphs based on their position in a word to create a more natural handwritten appearance. Notice how the glyphs are changed when I'm adding more letters to the words. Affinity also allows us to turn on and off ordinals. Ordinals are typographic features that format ordinal numbers by rendering the suffix letters as superscripts. This enhances the visual appeal and readability of text. Notice how the O after the 12 changes when I turn it on and off. I'm no expert on the matter, but it seems Affinity only implements the Unicode of ordinals, so keep that in mind. Fractions are kind of similar. By turning it on, the fractional number text will be properly scaled to numerators and denominators with a horizontal or diagonal separator. These are much cleaner and more readable than typing letters and slashes manually. Again, implementation is really dependent on the font face you're using. The next two buttons are for enabling the built-in superscript and subscript letter forms. Just like with all the options in this section, the actual characters that are turned to superscript or subscript depends on the implementation of the font face. In my example, it looks like numbers can be turned onto superscript or subscript. However, this font only supports a limited number of letters which are converted to subscript only. We can use the all caps button to turn all letters to capitals and we also got a small caps option which will turn everything into capitals, but use a smaller size of capitals for the lowercase characters. On the next row, the first two buttons are kind of related. Character variants and stylic sets allows us to use alternate versions of specific characters in a font, which will change the appearance of the text for stylistic purposes. The swash button enables or disables the swash option in the font. A swash is an extended stroke added to the letter form, often at the beginning or the end of a character. Swashes are common in script, calligraphic and display fonts and they are used to add elegance, flair and a sense of movement. As I don't have a font with swash, I can't really show you, but here is a screenshot of a font with swash applied. Notice also how the letter I from Y is sometimes with swash and sometimes without. The final button is the More Features option. Clicking on this will open up the Character Features panel. And actually, most of the options from this section we discussed are also available here. The Features panel will show all the features available in the active font phase and you can quickly enable or disable features. The feature list changes per font, so some fonts might have more features than others. That was a lot to absorb, but as always, the best way to learn is by experimenting with these options and seeing firsthand how they work. I hope you found this video useful, and if you liked it, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons before you leave. Thanks again for tuning in and until the next video.